So Maria, as I, I showed you before we started, I ran out of book flags <laughs> and then I just started to have to, um, you know, dog ear and write all in these pages. I have been waiting for this book in all seriousness since I went to film school at USC in 1982. And then I worked in the film business and there used to be a little mimeographed sheet of Chris Vogler's points about the hero's journey. It was like the secret thing that got passed around before he wrote his book. And I was always like so troubled by it and felt so much was missing. So just, I wanted to say thank you for writing your masterpiece. Oh, I'm thrilled to hear your words. And, you know, it's funny because I read Campbell with some reverence. Of course, given your school. background. Yeah. And then it was only years later when I started studying folklore and mythology that he came up again. And I realized that he was persona non grata in the academy. And everyone hated him. You you couldn't teach him. Are, are you crazy? You know, it's sort of like Young Campbell. Let's put those aside because they believe in timeless universals. So um, it was only during the pandemic that I revisited Campbell and reacted in the way that you just described, uh, worrying about the heroine's journey. Where was the heroine's journey? And why did they not travel? <laughs> and, uh, did they have any adventures at all? Well, yes, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And that was the beginning of my journey with this book. That's fascinating because I, years ago, thought where, what is the heroine's journey? Or for a while, I actually called it the Shiro's journey because I didn't even want to use the word heroine. But I lacked the incredible background that you have to really look at it the way you did. And I looked at some of the models that are out there, especially for writers, and there, there are some really intriguing things, but it, it still felt like it was lacking that depth that you brought of really bringing in all of these different ways throughout antiquity and fairy tales and mythology and, and then of course present day to say, well, what are some of the ways that we can look at writing our own story? Well, yes, exactly. And I think that in some ways you have to get away from the idea of a journey, which has become such ah. a cliche. I, I remember watching on my exercise bike, uh, watching the <laughs> Kardashians, <laughs> keeping up with the Kardashians, guilty as charged. Oh my God, that's hysterical. And, remember uh, professor watches keeping up with the Kardashians. Love it. <laughs> There they were talking about, it was near the end of the final season, and they were talking about the incredible journey that they had been on. And I thought, what, you know, what is, it? maybe we should just toss this idea of the journey and look at the attributes. What do these heroes, heroines do? What makes them heroic? So uh, in doing that, you know, suddenly I, I went in a completely different direction uh, because, you know, obviously you do have heroines who take journeys. You have in fairy tales, the young women who wear out iron shoes in their travels when they're trying to find uh, the beloved. Uh, and so there is uh, some traveling going on in fantasy, but in fact, you can be heroic even if you never leave the house. Um, so that was a way of getting at heroism, you know, in, you know, in a form that was different from, as I say, Campbell's journey, which is kind of a structural model. That's brilliant. And I'm so glad you said that because I have to admit, I went into the book going, okay, what's the model? What's the model? And then I was, I was yeah. probably three or four chapters in before I got it. You know, and I and I was feeling this sort of sense of frustration. And I do a lot of reading and prepping for these interviews. So I always have that fear I'm going to get it wrong or I'm going to miss something. That's just me. And then it clicked. I'm like, oh, you're showing me all these different ways of approaching being you're a hero. Awesome. Yes, that's exactly right. And I'm afraid that this is an academic book and that there's a long windup and a, a lot of throat clearing as well. Um, that's how we write. But <laughs> no, you know, no. I, it was, in a sense, I wanted to take the trip, I won't say, with you, that is to show you how I got to the place where I finally landed in thinking about heroines. Yeah, I didn't mean that as a criticism at all. You do that. I was just seeing it was a click for me in terms of the frame that I went into it at, which is kind of a meta moment, 
Because part of what you're doing in the book is saying this frame is really kind of bankrupt and always has been. Is that fair? Yes. Is that too much? Yes, it is that it's too general an idea. That is, uh, I think about how when I was raising my kids when they were small, I thought of every day as a kind of call to adventure, an ordeal, and also uh, a kind of not a return with an elixir or a magic potion, but I always felt at the end of the day that somebody should give me give me a medal for what I had done that day. Especially uh, if you had to like play Barbies. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I mean, in some ways, I think you can um, divide heroines and heroes into two categories. Heroes with a capital H, the big H, Hercules, uh, Achilles, all those um, all those warriors and spiritual leaders that we've seen as heroes. And then heroines uh, with a capital H and a small H as well. So uh, so I, I think that's a way of uh, kind of pushing the refresh button for a moment mm -hmm. and thinking in new ways about uh, heroism. And, you know, look at what has happened in our culture uh, post Me Too, post Black Lives Matter. Uh, we have statues that are being toppled. The old heroes just don't cut it anymore. The mm -hmm. Confederate soldiers are being replaced by civil rights activists. Or, uh, you know, we now think of healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, scientists as our new heroes. Uh, we're not, you know, thinking about. Uh, those who go into battle and kill, shoot, maim, and do all of those things. Although obviously there's, you know, there's still heroism in that in that arena. But right in this cultural moment, things look very different from the way that they looked in ancient Greece. Yeah. And yet our model is still ancient Greece in a funny way. That's ex that, that's exactly right. I work uh, worked uh, helped coach a writer. Um, Helen Morales, she's a professor of classics at UCSB, and around her book, her whole frame was, in the book, we as Westerners have put classical mythology on a pedestal, and the misogyny that is so built into it has, has shaped and colored our culture in some really nasty ways, and so I found some of that same echo of that questioning in your book, which was very exciting to me because I do think what your book keeps call, called me as a creative and as someone who works with creatives to say, what stories are you writing? What model are you looking for? And, yeah. and in particular, I, I feel like the question I wanna ask you is, um, Oh, I think I have an answer. Without me even answer asking the question, you yes, are a good yes. teacher. No, no, you've been leading me to two things. First of all, okay. uh, isn't it ironic that beloved has been challenged in the schools? And yet, yes. uh, let's look at Greek mythology where Europa is carried off by a bull. <laughs> we, don't, we don't worry about all the sexual assaults in Greek mythology. And so the question becomes, I don't think we should discard Greek mythology. We have to go back to those stories. But we also, as writers, if you're a writer, uh, if you're an academic, you want to try to understand the time and mm -hmm. place from which those stories emerge. But if you're a writer, you want to make it new. You want to reinvent the stories. I mean, we're all bound by tradition. No matter what, we don't create things <laughs> out of nothing. Uh, Never. And so we've got all these stories in our head and we take bits and pieces from tradition, put it together and make something new. So we may have a Philomela character or a Cassandra character, someone who resembles uh, those mythical creatures, those archetypes, but they're now settled in our own time and place. And the winds are blowing in very different ways. So what happens to those characters is going to shift and change and they will, they will become relevant and they will communicate with us in ways that I think uh, Cassandra from ancient times cannot. We sort of look at her as a fixed, fixed figure. 
So I, I hear you and I agree with you, but I also wonder how can we root out those same culturally repressive tropes that have, how do we, I feel like your book is calling us, your work is calling us to go someplace even fresher than just combining or questioning the old. Oh, yes. Well, I think we blow them up. Uh, we become iconoclasts. But then ironically, iconoclasts always manage to preserve the old in an odd sort of way. Mm -hmm. So by blowing them up, I would say exploding them, but also exaggerating them, enlarging them. Uh, think of the way that Anne Sexton, Angela Carter, Margaret Atwood, Toni Morrison took tales from times past and, and then took them apart, I would say, almost, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of, uh, I, I would say, um, took the bits and pieces and then made a completely new story. That's happening today with Greek myth, with Pat Barker's The Women of mm -hmm. Troy, or uh, Madeline Miller, Circe, who gives us a completely different perspective. But I would also say that you don't have to you know, decide, oh, I'm going to rewrite, I'm going to, I'm going to choose a character from Greek mythology and change her, I'll put her in the present or something like that. We can also just make something up and make up our own story. And it will resonate, it will mm -hmm. resonate in some ways with these figures from times past, that we now recognize as being, you know, not not what we aspire to, but, you know, in some ways, they incarnate the mistakes that have been made in the past. Uh, we have evolved in some ways, uh, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. <laughs> but, uh, but this, you know, kaleidoscopic, uh, kaleidoscopic shifting is so fascinating to me. It is to me, too. So let's go back to why did you become someone who studies folklore and mythology and fairy tales? Like, where, what drew you to this line of, of career and research and teaching and writing? It's writing so many wonderful books, not just the heroine with a thousand and one faces. <laughs> well, so many different moments in my life that led to it. Uh, the a book in the attic of the house we lived in with the title Kinder und Hausmärchen. And it was a book of the Grimm's fairy tales in German, uh, which meant that I couldn't read it. My parents were Hungarian. We were immigrants. Uh, this was a house given to us by the church. It had, you know, just the kind of attic that a child dreams of, things that you can discover. This book had beautiful illustrations. And my sister and I talked about those illustrations. She sometimes told me, she was older, so she knew the stories, mm -hmm. told them to me. And then I go to graduate school in German studies and you're not allowed to read the Grimm's fairy tales because they're not considered, they're children's literature, they're not worthy of academic analysis. And then fast forward to having children, reading with them, and discovering these horrifying stories like the juniper tree with a stepmother who decapitates her stepson and, and then chops him up in a stew and serves him up to her husband for dinner. I mean, this is Greek myth. This is where I began to realize these stories were not for, they weren't for children. Uh, they were told by adults to other adults. Sometimes children were present. But they were, they were tales that were melodramatic, operatic. They, they were the television and pornography of an earlier age. Uh, that's John Updike who tells us that. They, these stories had to be exciting because what were you doing at night? You were engaged in repetitive household chores, spinning, weaving, sewing, cooking, all Ending. the boring things and you needed to stay awake. And that's what sort of led me from fairy tales it was a short step to myth. Mm -hmm. And then what Tolkien calls the cauldron of story. And you begin to realize that all of these generic divisions that we make up, these uh, hierarchies of storytelling are pure nonsense. There's an ocean of the stream of stories and stories are always mixing and mingling with each other. And I love the way that you can find Little Red Riding Hood in African cultures, although she's not called Little Red Riding Hood, or you can find uh, Cinderella in China. And these are stories that there's just a golden network 
of folklore, of storytelling, of myth that I think connects us all. Mm, I love that, the cauldron of story. And I believe you said that in the book as well, quoted uh, Tolkien in the book as well. It feels like part of what creators are trying to do right now, going back to the cultural story that we've been talking about, is kind of dismantle nostalgia or show it for what it is. To me, it feels like a false, repressive, just shut up and go back to the way it is kind of story. And I feel like part of what you're doing in the book is, is, is helping us question that. Did that come up for you, this idea of... Because there's so much, there's so, I mean, the stories, the fairy tales and the myths over and over again are such stories of repressing women and shutting them up and cutting their tongues out. Uh, Yes, right. Uh, Well, yes, uh, two sides to that. One, uh, a pandemic. In times like this, we need comfort food. We also need stories to comfort us, to keep us alive, to keep us going. So in some ways, Uh, This is a nostalgic moment where we sort of go back to some of our foundational stories. But at the same time, I think because we're living in a time of crisis, of Mm -hmm. deep crisis, Mm -hmm. we're also challenging the old narratives and saying, these are not written in granite. These are not written in stone. They're interesting from a historical point of view. But we need to move forward and think about our own role models, our own figures, uh, which is not to say, you know, that literature should be all ideals and happiness. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there should be crisis, there should be drama, there should be troubles and uh, difficulties, a sea of troubles. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I don't want to be Pollyannish about it by any stretch of the imagination. But I think you're right that we need to resist the tendency to go back to the old, the tried and the true. And the speed with which we are reinventing everything is a little frightening, but in a sense, storytelling has to keep up with that. That's Uh, what I feel, that's exactly it. Storytelling has to keep up with it. Absolutely, yeah. And if you think about our new monsters, I mean, look at fairy tales. The beasts uh, were um, animals in the woods, predators. Uh, and then over the years, we began to realize, oh, the beasts are not our enemies. The uh, animals in the woods are not our enemies. But human beings are who are at the top of the food chain are the ones that we have to worry about. And now, you know, it seems like there's a new avenue of approach, which is we're looking at technology at uh, robots and uh, automatons and how they threaten our our existence as human beings. So uh, we're always disrupting. We're always disrupting and, and changing things. And our anxieties, our fears, and our desires are always shifting and morphing in, in new directions. One of the sections in the book that got me incredibly excited is when you wrote about women's curiosity and about the root of the word or the a different definition that's now antiquated of the word curiosity and a time that curiosity and care were linked. And I, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. It's extraordinary to me that um, curiosity in women is condemned. I mean, that is, you know, our greatest enlightenment value. Curiosity is linked with knowledge. Uh, That is, we value education. And yet do we, I think today we actually encourage kids to be curious. But in earlier centuries, you look at children's books and they all discourage curiosity. They saw it as a negative trait. Uh, So in women and in children, there's even the Garden of Eden. She's reaching for fruit from the tree of knowledge. Uh, And this is a story about progress, about leaving paradise and stasis, a place where nothing ever changes and developing a moral sense, knowing the difference between good and evil. She should be the hero of Genesis. And yet she's condemned as the creature who has brought sin and evil and death into the world. We are now mortals. Uh, Look at Pandora. She lifts the lid of the jar and she is condemned for her curiosity. And yet 
Pandora, she's, well, she gives us the human condition, which is uh, disease, plague, labor, all kinds of troubles and woes, but always hope. Hope is always, always there for us, the hope that things can improve, that they will get better. So what has happened, we, we've seen though that over time, uh, curiosity, uh, and by the way, Bluebeard's wife in fairy tales, same story. Uh, he's a serial killer and yet her curiosity, her desire to open the door and see all those corpses and discover that she really had better get out of the house pretty fast. <laughs> Uh, she's the one that's turned into the bad guy in the story all the morals from the 19th century tell us you know curiosity is a terrible thing and evil and you know today what is our cardinal virtue uh, not curiosity not care but compassion and empathy empathy is what is um uh is the word that you know my granddaughter just got the award in her school for kindness um, I thought that was, you know, I loved it, but, you know, it's also, I mean, that was the highest award. It was not academic achievement. It was kindness. Um, and my only worry about that is that when you, when you start to push kindness, empathy, and compassion too hard on kids, kids are contrarians, and they might run in the opposite direction. So I think we have to be careful about what we promote. Um, but I'd like to see us do a little bit more of the curiosity. Um, and, and again, we don't want to push it too hard, but promoting curiosity in subtle ways, you know, not by hammering kids over the head with it, but promoting that and enabling children children also to see that when you're curious, you're cultivating care and concern for an object, for a person. You're curious about another person's life. Uh, you're curious about how they got to school. That means that you care for them and understanding how these two are not just etymologically linked, but also just linked in terms of um, their emotional valence uh, that, you know, they really belong to their partners in crime, if I may call it that, uh, they're co-conspirators. And uh, that to me, that partnership is what gives me hope. And I can't help but read the way that curiosity was turned in these different tales over throughout history to be something bad as the patriarchy is saying, forget it, women, you're no curiosity, curio no, nothing that takes you out of the same constricted realm. It's just so clear. And I love, I was, one of the things that excited me so much in the book, you wrote um, how curiosity got tied to sexual, un, uh, unrestrained sexual cravings. Uh, and yeah. after I got over being angry about seeing how our curiosity was not only belittled, but turned into something, you know, bad and, and that could get us labeled, you know, unvirtuous at the best. I realized that curiosity and learning both gives us power but it also gives us aliveness. I mean, when I was reading your book, I was so alive and so excited. And while it definitely wasn't, you know, it wasn't turned on or, you know, but I could see how it shaded into that, like women being alive and learning and having power had to be constrained. Oh, absolutely. And I love what you just said, because it takes us into the arena of animation how stories animate us. Uh, they're mm -hmm. what makes us human, you know, in a way. And we've been talking about robots, machines, and technology and all of that. I mean, the storytelling instinct in human beings and, and the way that we are animated and empowered by learning, by discovering new things. Uh, it's something so extraordinary. It's a gift that I wish we could give. To, and I think Children, you know, I, I, sometimes I think education takes kids in a problematic, I, I was just about to say toxic direction, but I think about going into kindergarten classrooms and that electrifying energy and curiosity in there. And, and the way that kids run into school, they've got their knapsacks on, they're racing into the school. By the time you get to high school, 
yeah. dragging, they're uh, slouching. And what do what do we do to you know pound that excitement out of them? So, uh, you know, I hope we think of new ways to animate to uh, make kids curious. There's a great line in Ted Lasso too, of which I can't recall exactly, but it's about you know if you're not curious, if you're not curious. Uh, you will never understand others. You've lost the ability to connect with others, to know something about their lives. And instead of judging and evaluating and mm. being outraged, let's be curious about how that other person got to that view. And then maybe we can find some common ground. Well, I just want you to know that you just made the best episode list for the season for my husband because Ted Lasso has become very 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 important to him <laughs> he, he just can't get enough of it I think he's watched he's watched both both seasons twice now <laughs> which he's never isn't done that, before isn't extraordinary because I know a lot of guys too who have mm -hmm. just bonded with Ted Lasso in extra and I think it's because he gives them an opportunity to be compassionate and caring mm -hmm. I mean what an unexpected hero mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, you know I think that really tells me that the model of heroism that I developed in in the book is not gendered at all that you know there are ways in which men are gravitating toward the new model of the the heroine and women are, at least in Hollywood, becoming the swashbuckling warrior. I mean, think of Snow White and the Huntsman, where everyone mm -hmm. is armed and ready for combat, mm -hmm. or uh, some of these uh, films and novels, like The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Uh, I mean, there's a fit, Elizabeth Salanda is kind of androgynous. So uh, that takes us to the whole question of gender fluidity as well. So I'm not trying to establish a gender binary uh, right. because hero heroes are not all coded coded male or hero but we're sort of stuck with these these gender terms um and a kind of male coded action model versus a, a sort of uh, female model that is coded with empathy curiosity all those all those attributes that i identify this might be an odd question, but when you began the book during the pandemic, did you wonder if you would find enough stories of heroines? Uh, that's a great question, because all I can say is that I made it up as I went along and that, you know, I used the pandemic as an opportunity to read broadly. And, and I remember this great moment where it was January, dusk, darkness, a friend was ill with COVID, mm -hmm. and I picked up a little bookshop in Paris by Nina George. Uh -huh. And it's about a, uh, um, a shopkeeper who, when a person walks into his store, he can match them up immediately with the book that they need at that particular moment. And I started reading and I was hooked. And I realized that I had found the book that I needed at that particular moment. And suddenly I had a, you know, a terror sort of yielded to hope. Mm. I had this sense that it was not also terrible and terrifying. And so, you know, this immersive reading experience just made me long. I mean, I was animated. I wanted to read more and I kept reading and suddenly you know, I began to see these patterns emerging, these wonderful patterns emerging. And, you know, each day I would read something new and I would think, oh my God, this is so obvious. You know, this is becoming, somebody must have written this before. I can't be, the, and, and I did come across books like the wonderful Cassandra Speaks. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but, Elizabeth Lesser. Uh, Mm -hmm. oh, it's it, Elizabeth Lester's book, and we just corresponded. And uh, I love the way she described our books as separated at birth. Because they That's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. And and so uh, uh, so yes, they. You know what was astonishing to me was that everything seemed to fit. Things, and I kept looking for deviations from the norm. And of course, I found them. But uh, what I uh, 
could not believe was that every book had a story to tell me that fit in with what I was thinking about heroism, that you know, nothing was irrelevant, basically. Everything that I was reading sort of contributed to this gigantic stew of a book. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a wonderful feeling. Take us in a little bit to your writing process. Do you, as you would have those insights, do you write them down? Do you start a document? Do you let it all hold in your head? Um, hard to tell. Sometimes I... Um, I discover, I get my ideas by writing mm -hmm. and then I have to throw out the prose because it doesn't work. And, you know, that somehow uh, I learned very early on in graduate school that you can't just keep reading and reading and reading and doing research and then writing a book <laughs> because by the time you get to <laughs> writing, you've forgotten, <laughs> despite those notes, you've forgotten. And, and you've also lost some of the excitement. And, and yes, that's exactly it. it. Yeah. You yeah. read my mind, Maria. That's exactly it. There's like, you have this aha. So how do you, and you need to capture it. Yes, it's lightning in a bottle. And what I tell my graduate students all the time is write every day. Hmm. You know, uh, just take, you know, do some reading, uh, but do that in the afternoon, in the evening, and then uh, use that as your inspiration for them. And even if it doesn't fit in with your dissertation or book or paper or whatever, uh, you will writing sort of forces you to think. John Didion said it perfectly. You know, she writes in order to understand what she's thinking, to sort of take the, I, I think she uses the term, the phantasmagoria of everyday life and figure out, distill it, figure out what it, what it means. So uh, that is one part of the writing process. And then I also had the challenge of, uh, after I finished the book, my editor gave me notes, and uh, I mean, he was extraordinary. He gave me Bob Weil at WW at Libright and W. W. Norton gave me notes, and basically, what I saw was, oh my God, I have to rewrite the whole thing. And so I left it for three months and did not think about the book at all. I, I just read Joseph Campbell. That's all I did. <laughs> And I came back to it and, and then it was a pleasure. Then it was pure. It was just effervescent. It was real, just fun. How was it to go back and read Joe Campbell during those months? Did it, what did it do for you? Uh, I think that, you know, I, uh, I, I started out thinking that I had a love hate relationship with him because I admire him tremendously as a scholar. Mm -hmm. I mean, he went global before the rest of the world did. He learned languages, he learned cultures in a deep sense. He thought of storytelling in the way that I, I do, or maybe I learned from him about how to think about storytelling. And he also, you know, had religion in his orbit mm -hmm. as well and in very powerful ways. And I think that what I ended up seeing was that Campbell was, and you know, he was a, a product of his time and place. He was doing extraordinary things and he was an incredible spiritual mentor to mm -hmm. so many people. And if you watch The Power of Myth, mm -hmm. I mean, so likable. And I realized that, um, you know, I was not, that I could not have written the heroine book without Campbell. Mm -hmm. That he was in a sense, my partner. And that, uh, you know, I was, I was not revising him or challenging him because I think that the hero's journey still holds in, in many ways. Um, but, you know, that he sort of challenged me to look at things in a different way because I wasn't just going to write a counterpart to the to his, you know, a female, you know, the female version of the hero, hero hero's journey. Uh, I had to do something else, something different. And Campbell himself knew that uh, times were changing and mm -hmm. that the old models were just, and near the end of his life, he wrote about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I admired his his flexibility as as well. So, so yes, I, you know, it's no longer an, ambival uh, an ambivalence uh, toward him. It's not love-hate, but it's deep admiration for who he was and what he, I mean, who else would go to upstate New York and live, live in a, a chicken coop? <laughs> 
and live in a chicken and just read. No, I always thought that. that you lived in a chicken coop. Now that's he talked about someone who had a lot of curiosity. That's right, exactly. And and I don't know. I'd be curious to know actually whether he did much writing at that time. You know, it, whether he mm -hmm. really just spent several years reading widely and broadly and escaping graduate school, where they tried to put him in a narrow disciplinary box. How have you escaped being put into a narrow disciplinary box? Because you have. I mean, you you know you you the the African folk tales, right? With with yeah, yeah. Henry yeah. Louis Gates and, you know, that, I mean, it feels like you have within this realm managed to really think and, 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 and create in a lot of different ways. I know that's a real challenge for all of us, but especially in academia. Well, it helped to have tenure. I will say that. Because, <laughs> it does. Because I, I will say I had many colleagues who disapproved of the direction in which I went. Uh, that is, they could not understand why I was writing about fairy tales. And uh, they were disappointed that I was not teaching a graduate course on one writer, which was the model at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, so I had this freedom to to move in new directions. And also I suffer from a kind of academic ADD where I just, you know, I can't spend my life working on Goethe or on Milton or even Shakespeare. <laughs> so, uh, as I, and, and, you know, again, curiosity, animation, new, always looking for new territory and moving from one realm to another. And uh, the excitement of that is just so exhilarating to me. And the biggest challenge was African-American folklore because I knew nothing about it. I decided I would give a course when Skip Gates and I decided to write the book. I thought that the best way to train myself was to give a course on the subject. And I had 15 wonderful students who were so patient with, who learned the material with me. And it was the most exciting academic adventure ever uh, because by the end of it, we had become we had become experts together in a way and it was that's so awesome. I mean so many professors especially at an Ivy League school would not allow themselves that vulnerability and that newness I and mean, that must really feed your creativity being able to take that kind of risk with your students and not have to be walk in there puffed up as the expert but walk in there and say we're learning this together I, it, it was a rather daring thing to do. And it I is, I love it. Students, I credit the students with it because they, you know, we started the course, but my noting that there was no entry in Wikipedia on African-American folklore. What and year was this? Was shocking. Uh, this was probably about eight or nine years ago. Wow. And Wikipedia had, you know, was really quite already robust by then yeah informative robust yeah. yes absolutely and um yes i do give my students the credit for it and uh and also i guess uh one of the things that my students taught me is that the more adventurous you are and the more you think big and take up material that, you know, I always counted, I always looked at their eyes and their body language. I mean, even in a lecture hall, when they lunge forward, you know that you're yeah. on a good track. So, so they were wonderful mentors to me in that way because they taught me what is interesting, what is exciting, where to go. And when they fell asleep, I knew yeah. <laughs> I, better, I better move on to something else pretty quickly. <laughs> That's great. I love that testing it out, but I still, I'm, I'm so blown away by the, your, your courage to do that really. And I, I, I want to go back to the curiosity because of what you just were talking about. What would you say to women who are listening about letting themselves take those kind of curious risks in their own work? <sighs> if you dig into yourself as a role model for a moment for us, what would you say, like what dragons did you have to walk past <laughs> to do that and to do this I mean in your work in general not just that that project I think you know tuning out the noise of the outside world often I mean I've just talked about the importance of the feedback from my students and and that was that 
has been, you know, a golden nugget that I, I, I treasure, but tuning out the voices of authority in a way. Yes. And, uh, you know, so I, and I, I don't want to get into a cliche of listening to that voice within, uh, but just trusting your instincts about what the next step is. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of our conversation, you talked about the secret sauce, you know, the hero's journey is, is a kind of secret sauce. And, and I think that there's a sense in which, you know, we're always looking for that silver bullet secret sauce. There is none. Guess what? So true. There, is there isn't. Yeah. Everything is hard won and you do have to fight for it. And you have to, one of the things I learned was that you have to keep challenging yourself. You know, sometimes you'll, you'll write a few pages and you'll think, oh, this is really great. And then you have to push yourself to the next level. And, and, and that's tough. And, you know, I love what I do. I, I can't imagine landing in a better place than I did land. But at the same time, if I look back, there were many moments of struggling of, uh, you know, not knowing really what I was doing, what is going to be my next move. And, uh, and maybe what always saved me was reading, you know, mm -hmm. reading the work of others and just saying, okay, I don't have to always be writing, you know, uh, let me go back and think about what others have done, how they have said it, what they struggled with, and then somehow they will help you find a path forward. And I say this about writers, but obviously about friends as well. And we all rely on, I mean, one of the tough things, it's always hard to get people to read things that are unpublished. Mm -hmm. uh, even my closest friends, you know, I'm, I'm very, I don't overload them with prose or I only occasionally, if I'm writing an essay or something like that, and it's short, I'll, I'll ask them to, to take a look. But often you are, you know, really alone with your, mm -hmm. with your writing. And so you have to count on those who came before you uh, who wrote and, uh, and had, you know, similar, similar struggles. Oh, I love that. Can, I would just love to imagine if you could, if you could take me in to when you're actually doing that reading, like, what do you decide to read? How do you find it? How do you, do you annotate in your books? That's three questions all piled into one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I have to say that I, you know, I'm constantly resolving not to buy any more books because I have a wonderful <laughs> life. I have a Widener Library, Harvard College Library. It doesn't get better than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, and, and I decided one day, okay, that's it. I'm not buying any more books. I'll just, you know, go, go to the library and get, because I was so over, my shelves were overloaded. I have piles of books everywhere. And uh, about a week later, I realized that I had bought about 30 books <laughs> and that, you know, I mean, what's better than being addicted to reading and, and what's better than having, you know, a pile of books so that, you know, you don't have to say, oh, I've got this and I have to read. I mean, I love the variety, the choice and the fact that, you know, I can pick up one thing, read three pages and then go on to the next, next, uh, next volume. So, and I love bookstores. I love looking at the tables. I love looking at staff picks. And, uh, you know, I think of, uh, oh, who is David Copperfield, uh, who is reading as if for life. Uh, and all of it, you know, that, that somehow, you know, your books become your companions and the characters become your companions and all of that. And then as for the process, I, I do annotate like crazy and I mess up my books and I bend mm -hmm. the spines and I consider that, you know, I mean, in some ways, about 10 years ago, I realized that it's okay to throw a book away and buy a new one. That is that version of uh, Middlemarch from college. Um, <laughs> you don't want to read that. Uh, the print is too great. small now. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be great to get a new version of it. So I annotate like crazy. And of late, one of the things that I've done, and this is a, uh, you know, probably goes hand in hand with aging. And that is that I keep a journal of my reading. 
So I, you know, when I, I start something that I'm going to be deeply absorbed in and immersed in for a while, I'll, I'll have a page and then I'll put in the great quotes from that book. And I love that because you can sort of go back and see, you know, these exciting moments in the, in the reading and, um, and I would say that I, one of my colleagues uh, always talks about how he loves the end of the semester because he can engage in promiscuous reading. <laughs> uh, and that's what, you know, it, it is sort of sampling this and that. And I love every, you know, I love biographies, uh, fiction, nonfiction, uh, children's books, YA fiction, uh, you know, uh, novels for, you know, romance, not so much sci-fi. Sci-fi is probably the only genre that I've never been able to really warm up to, but, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's all right. I've accepted that as a fact of life. <laughs> You've got enough to play with. Oh, what a wonderful conversation. I, I could talk to you about this book and about your work forever, but I'll respect our time. Thank you so much for writing this book and for talking to us about it and giving us other ways to think about our stories and how to create stories going forward. I really appreciate it. Oh, great to talk to you.